Good morning. My name is Jeff Smith. It's a uh, privilege to be with you. Uh, greetings from Peace Presbyterian Church over in Cary, where I'm one of the elders. I hope my voice will uh, not give out today. I actually feel very good. I had my first uh, post-pandemic head cold last week. I'm fully vaccinated. The relative I caught the head cold from is fully vaccinated. I don't have any COVID symptoms, so. Um, but I, I, I'll uh, do my best not to have my voice crack. Uh, greetings from Peace Presbyterian Church. It's good to be with you. I actually preached for you many years ago. Uh, I'm happy to stand in for John. Um, I'm actually an intern. Uh, I'm undergoing my first, uh, my, my one-year pastoral internship that the Book of Church Order requires for men who are interested in pursuing a pastoral call. Um, I've been in the business world for a long time. Uh, I've been a ruling elder for a long time, but um, this possible call is something that's uh, uh, been on my mind and heart for, for decades. So we'll see what the Lord does through this experience. And so um, I hope this sermon will bless you, but also you're blessing me by enabling me to uh, check off a box, so to speak, but more than that, uh, gain relevant experience um, in pastoral ministry this morning. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Our text for the Gospel lesson is found on page 735. It's Luke 10, 38 through 42. Hear now the word of God. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, to Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, back at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of us uh, remember good times with family or friends, even um, forming new and healthy habits of better sleep, more exercise. Many of us improved our personal devotional habits, even though we were distanced from our church families to one extent or another. I know I did. I became more faithful in my Bible reading and prayer as a result of the pandemic. Well, now that the pandemic is subsiding, we're getting busy again, aren't we? Uh, certainly you can tell by the traffic. And those improvements to our habits are threatened. So I believe this morning's message will be timely. Would you pray one more time with me for God's illumination on his word? <clears throat> Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you enable us to think your thoughts after you, to sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, and to understand and apply your word to our lives. We pray in his name. Amen. We Americans are busy people, aren't we? We devote a lot of our time to work. Even our leisure seems to be marked by too much activity and worry. <clears throat> Back in 1930, the famous economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that by the 21st century, we'd all be enjoying a 15-hour work week. In other words, having a five-day weekend. Keynes wrote, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to occupy the leisure. Almost 30 years later, in 1957, the New York Times predicted that as work became easier, we would define ourselves by our hobbies or our family life. To quote the Times, the increasingly automatic nature of many jobs coupled with the shortening work week leads an increasing number of workers to look not to work, but to leisure for satisfaction, expression, and even meaning. Certainly the decades since the 1950s have brought previously unimaginable labor-saving technologies to the factory, to the office, to the farm, the home. Labor-saving technology has improved dramatically. But better technology creates expectations that more can be accomplished in less time. And that's one reason we remain so busy. But there's another reason we remain so busy, 
especially with our paid labor. <clears throat> Derek Thompson of The Atlantic Magazine calls it workism. He writes in 2019, the economists of the early 20th century who expected so much leisure time in our present era failed to anticipate that work would remain a necessity for the poor and middle class. But for the college-educated elite, it would morph into a kind of religion, promising identity, transcendence, and community. Workism is among the most potent of the new religions competing for congregants. What is workism? It is the belief that not only is work necessary to making a living, but it's also the very centerpiece of identity and life's purpose. Thompson continues, in 1980, the highest earning men actually worked fewer hours per week than middle class or low income men. But by 2005, the richest 10% of married men had the longest average work week. Today, it's fair to say that elite American men have transformed themselves into the world's premier workaholics, toiling longer hours than both poorer men in the U.S. and rich men in similarly rich countries. Well, workism may have started with elite men, but it has spread to women and to the young. According to research in 2018, 95% of teens said having a job or career they enjoy would be extremely or very important to them as an adult. This ranked higher than any other priority, including helping other people who are in need, 81%, or getting married, 47%, finding meaning at work beats family and kindness as the top ambition of today's young people. We Americans value dedication to our work. Staying busy has become a social status symbol. The manner and role of our service to others is how our society values a person's worth. It's in this kind of culture that we in the American church, of course, find ourselves. We're not immune to this religion of workism. However, what the Atlantic magazine calls workism is actually nothing new, nor is it uniquely American. The work was created by God for our good, and his glory, our sin nature, distorts it just as it does the rest of creation. As with everything in the Christian life, our service to God and neighbor needs to be governed by the priority of whole life faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We find in this familiar account of Martha and Mary that we can make our service to Jesus into something more important to us than it was ever meant to be. Being busy, even by extending hospitality to the most important person in the universe, is not necessarily obedience to God's will. As fallen people, we get our priorities wrong, as Martha did here, perhaps to our surprise. God's caution to us, friends, in this passage is that Believers are tempted to prioritize serving the Lord over receiving from him, receiving his word in faith. Like Martha, Christians are often tempted to prioritize serving the Lord over receiving from him. Just as workism makes work out to be the meaning of life, so Martha here makes serving Jesus out to be the essence of faithful living. As a result, we are anxious and troubled about many things, just as Martha was. Most of you here know this, this kind of temptation, at least with some level of awareness. I know I do. Having come to know Christ by faith at some point in, earlier in my life, I became active in the church, using my spiritual gifts as God commands. And like so many of you, I strive to work hard at what God has called me to do during the week, whether at home or on the job. For some of you, that means striving to excel in school. But we can deceive ourselves into thinking, perhaps even not with full awareness, that our attempts to serve the Lord Jesus are more important than what he offers us day in, day out, in the unchanging pages of Scripture. But as Jesus tenderly corrects Martha here, so he is reminding us that true faith is more concerned with receiving from Jesus than with giving to him. True faith is more concerned with receiving from Jesus than with giving to him. This sounds backwards, yes? 
Wouldn't the purest, most mature faith result in great acts of service to the Lord? Let's examine the passage to understand. Luke 10, 38 through 42, please look at the passage. It teaches three aspects of vital faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first aspect is that we should beware Martha's distraction. Beware Martha's distraction. Because true faith focuses on receiving from Jesus more than on giving to him. We should beware Martha's distraction. Now let me describe the context of the passage so that we have a little more understanding of what is going on. At the beginning of Luke chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, but you're welcome to if you'd like. Jesus had appointed 72 others to travel to every town and place where Jesus himself was about to go. He sent the 72 ahead of himself in Paris to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus tells the 72 to depend on the hospitality of the townspeople where they visit. He forbids them from carrying their own money, their own food, even their own sandals. And the blessing and peace of God would then rest upon those who extended hospitality to the messengers of Jesus in those towns. Jesus taught that extending hospitality to those 72 sent by him was a sign of faith in Christ. The townspeople's response to these complete strangers, that is, to Jesus' disciples, would function as their response to Jesus himself. So here in our sermon passage, sometime later, Jesus and his disciples arrived in a village, likely one that at least one pair of the 72 had visited. We're not told the town's name, but presumably it was Bethany, as we learn in John 11 that Bethany was the village of Mary and her sister Martha, undoubtedly the same sisters as are named here. And it seems reasonable that these sisters would have known of Jesus at least two, from at least two of the 72 he had sent to preach in Bethany, ahead of him. Martha usually gets a bad rap from this passage, doesn't she? But I want to point out something good that God has preserved for us here, that Martha, probably the older sister of the two, welcomed Jesus into her house, verse, verse 38, either alone or possibly he was accompanied by some of his disciples. But she did a commendable righteous thing by invent, inviting Jesus in. As Jesus had made clear earlier to the 72 he sent out, by receiving Jesus into her home, taking care of his needs, she was expressing love for him and trust in Israel's God, of whose kingdom Jesus was the head and chief representative. Now in first century Palestine, hospitality was a customary practice in which people welcomed travelers. There was no Hilton or Hampton Inn. And these travelers were often strangers. And they provided them with food, comfort, and protection. Taking strangers into one's home was a risky proposition in the first century, just as it's a risky proposition to some extent anywhere in the world today. When guests arrived, hosts fed them a meal and potentially provided lodging. Provided lodging. And hosts would often, also uh, customarily, would give them water for washing their feet and new clothes even if they needed them. So this was a strong tradition in first century Palestine. But it's, just, it's not just a tradition for them. It's also a command to us. Hebrews 13, 2, commands all Christians, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Hospitality is commended in the lives of those who would follow Jesus. And we see Martha expressing an obedient faith in God by inviting Jesus into her home just as it was for Martha and the townspeople who received the 72 that Jesus sent out. So it is with us. True faith indeed means serving Jesus. I don't want you to walk away from here thinking that somehow service to Jesus is wrong or bad or not an aspect of true faith. And specifically, we see true faith in service expressed here through hospitality. Hospitality is actually a significant need and ministry opportunity right here in Clayton in 2021. Many people are moving to the area, to central North Carolina, and many neighbors, old and new, feel isolated, particularly coming out of the pandemic. Many of them don't trust institutions, including the church, maybe especially the church, but they're willing to come to your back patio or your kitchen as guests. 
And perhaps some in this congregation here long for the kind of encouragement other believers can provide through hospitality of some form. So hospitality is a need, and as we already heard from Hebrews chapter 13, Christians must not neglect to practice it as part of their lives. As we treat members of the body of Christ, so we treat Christ himself. So we should note that Martha did right by extending hospitality to the Lord Jesus, something we can do indirectly to him ourselves by extending hospitality to one another and to strangers. Serving Jesus by serving others is truly of great importance. But serving Jesus by serving others is not the most important aspect of Christian faith. It is an expression of our faith, but it is not the essence of our faith. Martha had opened her home to Jesus. We're told that she was worried and upset amid her preparations. Her honored guest had begun to give an extended teaching session. <laughs> Mary was completely attentive. Martha's sister sat at the feet of Jesus, as was customary for disciples of rabbis in that day. But this Jesus was Martha's attitude and demand for Mary's help in preparing food would have been a lot more reasonable if this had been any other guest. But Luke's Gospel makes clear to the reader in the chapters leading up to this passage that this guest is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man and the Son and Chosen One of the Most High God. It seems reasonable to think that two of the 72 whom Jesus sent ahead of himself had let Martha know to expect Jesus when he and his disciples arrived at Bethany. And as further evidence that Martha knew this man was special, we read that Martha addressed Jesus as Lord in verse 40, suggesting that she was aware of the unique nature of this man. The passage makes clear that though Martha had properly invited Jesus into her home, she had suddenly fallen into sin. Let me read the five verses again. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things but one thing only is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Are you surprised by Jesus' reaction to Martha's request? He sides with Mary. Martha was hard at work in the kitchen, while her sister relaxed on the floor, simply listening to their guests. Is it not reasonable that Martha would eventually ask Jesus whether he cared that she was shouldering the burden of food preparation on her own? Well, to answer that question, let's try to imagine a situation that might roughly approach a contemporary equivalent. Imagine that Elon Musk had come to your home and was giving a free private lecture on space travel and the future of electric vehicles. Or pretend that you had welcomed Warren Buffett into your living room and he was offering free personal advice on investment and finance. Or imagine that the world's expert on nutrition, health, and fitness was there at your kitchen table, willingly sharing her guidance to anyone in your home who would receive it. Would you be honoring your guest to remove his or her audience? Would you be benefiting yourself or your household by insisting that everyone prepare food instead? Granted, we don't know if others were there in the house. No one else, including their brother Lazarus, is mentioned in the text here. But the fact remains that Martha addressed Jesus as Lord and yet would have preferred that he stop his teaching and instead tell Mary to get busy. In the following chapter, you don't have to turn there, Jesus says, The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh 
will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Luke 11, 31 and 32. Jesus was not just any guest. Out of all the places in time and history, he was there in their home, giving a free personal discourse on the matters that matter most. Jesus was one who spoke words of eternal life, according to Peter in John 6. Jesus was not just any guest. Martha was in the wrong. Mary was in the right. Martha's request to Jesus sounds responsible and motivated by good intentions. But doesn't sin usually present itself in such ways? For the Christian, sin is so often commingled, mixed with doing something commendable and upright. And it is for this reason that we need to be constantly on guard. We need to constantly train our discernment by the Word of God to learn to, learn to distinguish good from evil. Martha sinned in at least three ways of which we should be aware as we reflect on our own tendencies. First, she makes an ultimatum suggesting that Jesus is uncaring. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Then tell her to help me. How quickly we accuse the Lord of not caring about our needs. If not openly, then in our hearts. And yes, there is a proper and righteous pleading with God to help us that we see throughout the Bible. I'm not talking about that. It's when we start applying our own litmus test for divine love that we know, or should know, we're setting ourselves up to be God's judge. As mentioned earlier, Martha clearly believed Jesus to have authority within himself because she appeals to him as one who can tell Mary to obey him. If he would just tell Mary to help Martha, yet she subtly passes judgment on the Lord Jesus. Martha says, in effect, Lord, if you truly cared for me, then you would do according to my wishes. And how often do we do the same? Lord, do you not care that I'm struggling with my health, with my finances, with my marriage? If you really cared for me, then you would remove this illness, get me out of debt, and make my marriage happy. And yet the Bible makes clear that God has a good plan for his people in all their divinely ordained trials. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us things? Romans 8, 31 and 32. Friends, we sin by setting up our own tests by which we judge the genuineness of God's care. So Martha's ultimatum to Jesus was sinful in view of who Jesus was and is. A second sin, Martha sins by not respecting her sister's need for Christ's teaching and the comfort Mary derived from it. Martha assumed Mary was in the wrong for listening to Jesus rather than helping in the kitchen. Yet Jesus rebukes Martha and declares in verse 42, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Even if Martha somehow did not need to listen to Jesus. Martha incorrectly assumed it was Mary's calling to serve Jesus in the same way that she, that is Martha, was called to serve him. And don't we do this too? We judge other believers by our own gifting and preferences. We assume that if other people are busy in church activities the way I am, schooling their children the way we are, reading the Bible with the same frequency I do, then they must be faithful. But if not, well, I just might think they're less mature in their faith than I am. Just as we must not pass judgment on the Lord by our own standards, so we must not pass judgment on others for their failure to meet our standards, standards that come from our own opinions and not from God. We should instead focus on building others up according to their need. We all have differing needs and strengths. In addition to showing hospitality to Jesus, Martha should have concerned herself with what Mary needed as well. 
And as God's people, we should look out for one another's needs, at least as much as we consider one another's duties. Martha wasn't doing that. Finally, Martha sinned by overlooking for herself, for her own self, her own soul, the priority of listening to Jesus. And this sin underscores my main point here, that we should beware Martha's distraction. Luke tells us Martha was distracted by her servant. Distracted from what? Distracted from receiving the Lord's teaching. We are busy. We can be busy with sinful activities. But professing Christians, like most of us in this room, are perhaps more likely to be sinfully busy with upright activities. To draw again from earlier in Luke's Gospel, Jesus speaks in his parable of the soils about the seed that fell among thorns. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear the word of Christ, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Luke 8, 14. See, we can do lawful and responsible things, but at the expense of our most foundational need. The believer's most essential need is to sit at the feet of Jesus and receive the truth from him. Not merely being busy with living a responsible and respectable life, but being his disciple. And this is the one thing that is necessary in life. Yes, we need to serve in the church, serve our family, work as unto the Lord, and otherwise put our faith into practice. But if we're not careful, we can take our church activities and an active life and crowd out the priority of learning from Jesus. Learning in sermons, in Sunday school, in family and individual Bible reading and other contexts. And I'm not here meaning to prescribe a one-size-fits-all plan for everyone's learning. But I am asserting what Jesus does in Luke 10. That learning from him, learning with devotion and trust, as sitting at his feet implies. That learning from him is more important to him and more foundational for our Christian discipleship than even our kindest acts of service to him. Brother, sister, do you evaluate your life primarily by even activity in the name of Christ? Or primarily by your trust in what he says in the scriptures? Martha's distraction from receiving from Jesus leads her to be anxious and troubled about many things. And so it is for us. The second aspect of vital faith we learn from this passage is that we can emulate Mary's devotion. Emulate Mary's devotion. Because true faith focuses on receiving from Jesus more than on giving to him. We can emulate Mary's devotion. True faith realizes our greatest need to receive from Jesus. He does not need our service. Those so we learned about in Sunday school, he takes pleasure in it when we act in faith. But what we need most is to receive from Jesus, particularly his teaching, preserved for us in all the pages of the Bible. Because to receive Jesus' teaching is to receive Jesus and all his benefits. Listen to Matthew 11, 22 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. We don't know exactly what Jesus was teaching in the home of these sisters. We don't know what it was that so engaged and entranced Mary, but whatever it was, it proved to be of great interest to Mary. Now, Mary could have prevented Martha's socially uncomfortable request if she had listened to Jesus for merely a moment and then excused herself to help Martha, but she seated herself at Jesus' feet, stayed there long enough to prompt Martha's irritation. Surely, as Mary was learning at the feet of Jesus, she was finding rest for her soul, finding for herself what anxious Martha really needed. The scriptures tell us that by this time in Jesus' ministry, Jesus' teaching and accompanying acts were transforming lives. 
In Luke chapter 7, again, you don't have to go there, but I'm just giving you some background. Jesus told a sinful woman that her sins are forgiven, and she also ended up sitting at Jesus' feet, if you remember the passage, and washing his feet with tears of gratitude. She was forgiven much, and so she loved much. Jesus' teaching transformed her. And in Luke chapter 9, Jesus confirmed that he is indeed the Christ of God and taught that he will be killed by the religious authorities and raised on the third day. We don't know what Jesus exactly taught in this occasion with Mary, but it elicited her devotion, as his teaching always does, to those who receive it in faith. And that's because the word of Christ gives life. The Apostle Peter wrote that we are born again by receiving the teaching about Jesus. The Holy Spirit uses Jesus' teaching about his person and work to draw us to trust in him rather than in our own good works, to love him, to take up our cross and follow him daily. This teacher and his teaching are transformative. Jesus changes people from the inside out by his word, making them into devoted and willing disciples. Receiving the word of Christ is like being given a new set of prescription eyeglasses or contact lenses. You knew something wasn't quite right before. You were squinting and everything was blurry, unclear. But as you receive these lenses and wear them for the first time, you see everything in crisp and beautiful clarity in a new way. And you want to continue to wear them so that what you see has the same beautiful clarity. And in Christ, reality is always ultimately beautiful for those to whom he gives new sight. Have you been drawn to Jesus' teaching, to sit at his feet, and to continue to learn from him? Yes, our efforts to please him through our service are practical and important, as we've talked about, but secondary. The Christian life is primarily about receiving the word of Christ, and only secondarily, derivatively, about rendering service to him as a result of what his word has done in us. The work of God is to believe in him whom he has sent. We overvalue what we can do for Jesus and undervalue how much we need him and how much others need him too. When we receive the teaching of Christ in faith, we receive Christ and want to receive more. As we receive the gospel of Christ, we inevitably emulate Mary's devotion to him. The third and final aspect of true faith that we learn from this passage is to receive our portion. The notes should say, receive your portion. Sorry about that. Because true faith focuses on receiving from Jesus more than on giving to him, we receive a good portion which will never be taken away. What does Jesus mean in verse 42 by the good portion, or as the NIV here has it, what is better that Mary has chosen? The word here is used elsewhere in Scripture to refer to an assigned share or ration. It sometimes refers to a portion of food, but is also linked closely with the idea of an inheritance. In Deuteronomy 21, the firstborn son is given the right to a double portion of the inheritance. And Psalm 73 declares, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. So Jesus, on words here, regardless of what's going on in the kitchen, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away. A portion of food? Actually, an eternal inheritance that she can taste even now, figuratively speaking. This good portion is given to her as she sits at the feet of Jesus, and it is there she must stay in her devotion to Christ, receiving his word. And so it is with us. Suppose that a wealthy relative died, a relative who promised to leave you a portion of his inheritance. Suppose you were gathered with others to hear the will read. Would you listen casually and distractedly, or would you listen intently to hear what was left to you and how much? You would certainly be listening with great care. In such a way, we likewise should hear the word of Christ, especially the good news of the great inheritance he has purchased for us by his blood. He has secured for us 
Christian, God's favor and forgiveness, the sure hope of eternal life, our bodily resurrection, and a renewed creation without sin or sorrow. To receive our eternal portion, we must, like Mary, remain at Jesus' feet, receiving and relishing in his teaching, even as we go about the various pursuits of life to which he has called us. Yes, even acts of hospitality and service. Such is the first order of business in the Christian life. Whether we came to faith last week or last century, only in this way will we avoid Martha's distractions and maintain in our lives the devotion of Mary. Perhaps like me, you're old enough to have known some who were like Mary at the start of their Christian profession, but have since gotten distracted and are on a dangerous path. I think of friends that I had in my 20s, professing Christians who did not, did not continue sitting at the feet of Jesus in weekly public worship, in private Bible reading, and in speaking of the word with friends. They've stunted their growth in Christ, squandered God's blessings, and in at least one case, renounced the Lord altogether. Listen, I'm a Calvinist. I'm a Presbyterian elder. And I know that God will never abandon his elect. But I also know the clear warnings of Scripture. We can only know that we truly belong to God as we persevere in our discipleship under Christ. And in receiving from Christ his precious promises, warnings, and wisdom. The writer to the Hebrews exhorts us that we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. He was writing to professing believers. We Christians are like vacationers at the beach, playing in the ocean. We're just treading water, so we think. But we look up at the shore and realize the current has really taken us far away. To be passive is to drift. And so it is in our relationship with the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ. We need constantly to pay attention to it, to receive His Word, lest we become dangerously distracted and drift. Why would God give this exhortation and so many others like it in His Word to Christians if we believers are not tempted towards thinking we have arrived, that we don't need to receive the Word of God the way we once did? I once asked a professing Christian whether she was currently reading the Bible, and she said, oh no, I've already read it. Well, the Word of God is our spiritual food. It's not like any other book. And we need a steady diet of it if we're going to live spiritually. Indeed, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to hear the Word read and preached when we gather on the Lord's Day, just as we're doing now every week but also in our homes, as we learn in Deuteronomy 6, teaching God's Word to our children, speaking about Christ and the Word when we sit in our houses, when we walk, when we lie down, when we rise. We're exhorted in Colossians to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. And if this all sounds burdensome, friend, just confess it to the Lord. <laughs> I believe. Help my unbelief. That's my own prayer at times when I feel cold towards the things of God. And God loves to answer that prayer, and he will. And keep in mind that practices of personal devotion are, as a former pastor of mine put it, worth doing poorly. The point is to form a pattern of life in which you're learning from Christ and about Christ through the scriptures. Sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back, isn't it? Our own dull affections are the reason we get distracted, not lack of time. But trust the Lord and pray to him to renew your love for his word and thereby renew your devotion to him. It's only by remaining at the feet of Jesus, receiving his teaching, that you will obtain the eternal inheritance Jesus promises. As he said in John 8, 31, if you abide or continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. So the Lord would say to all of us sooner or later, brother, sister, you are anxious or tr and troubled about many things, but just one thing is necessary. 
Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. We are a busy and distracted people. Why? Perhaps because, like Martha, we are tempted to prioritize serving the Lord over receiving from Him, receiving His Word in faith. We never grow beyond needing a steady diet of teaching of the Lord Jesus. In fact, it's dwelling on the Word of God that powers proper service to God and neighbor. Paul said, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And we love because God first loved us in Christ. And we need to know of his love for us in Christ at all times. From the word of God. It is food for our souls and fuel for our service to God and neighbor. Martha was right in wanting to extend hospitality to Jesus. She was wrong in prioritizing what she could do for him over her need for him. Abide in the word of Christ, and your soul will never go hungry. Let us pray. We praise you, God, for giving us the bread of life in your Son. Thank you that he satisfies us, and that by feeding on him we are satisfied eternally. Apply this word to us, we pray. We are a busy and distracted people, and not necessarily the better or more fruitful for it. Help us to love your word to believe you will bless and transform it, to transform us through it. And as you do that work through the word of Christ, cause us to anticipate eagerly the eternal inheritance you have promised to all who sit at your feet. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.